good morning. Everybody awake? So, Jeff Childs, I work for Yaskawa America. Uh, I'll, I'd like to take a little bit of your time just to talk about VFDs. And before we get started, because this is like the third year I've done this, wanted to just get a flavor for who all is here. Um, uh, talking to the guys earlier, it sounds like most of you are here getting with pivots. Is that correct? So, majority of pivots. Um, for your pumps, are they mostly uh, vertical hollow shafts, submersibles? What do, what do you guys got? Mostly vertical hollow shaft. Vertical hollow shaft. Okay. Um, what horsepower range? Does it just depend on who I'm talking to, or I mean, 150. 150. So, about how deep are most of the wells? 500. 500. So pretty deep. Okay. Okay. Um, we're used to where we have little wells, uh, just on a, a sub, 30 horsepower sub. And uh, where we have speed control and soft starters. Where, we, where is your wells? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna. Um, so some of you guys are using gen gen sets. About how many? Uh, was that everywhere, or just in certain fields or certain areas? Um, where you do have AC. Everybody got three phase, 460, single phase. What are we talking? Mostly 460? Yeah. Okay. Um, on the pivots, and then this is something I've had different people say different things. So, um, how often do you guys have to change the nozzles through a irrigation season? At all? Once? Twice? Do you change them to do fertilizer and then change them back? Or do you have a second head for fertilizer or just run it in the same thing? That's the same thing. I mean, most everybody, hopefully we'll be changing the beginning of the season for what we think we're going to have all the season. But okay, we'll have if things don't go quite right, we'll go down, down track. Okay. I've heard people talk about that. Yeah, having to re-nozzle, but I didn't know how common it was. Uh, you try to do it for the years. Sure. Sure. So how many of you guys have, you know, VFDs on, you know, with AC power? One, two, three, four? Okay. Um, how, for those four, how are you using it? Are you using mostly as a soft start, you know, constant pressure, just changing speed, speed of it, and change it just automatically? This, this month you set it, and next month you set it at 55, depending on how much water you need, or? Or is it dependent on how many pivots you're running at one time? We have some speed, some pressure, some drawdown. Okay, so you are doing some drawdown. Okay. Um, for those that uh, have VFDs, uh, you know, if you were to look at doing it again, would you do it again? Okay. What would you do differently if you did it again? Probably put drawdown tubes on everything. Okay. Now, when I'm talking about drawdown, I'm talking about putting a transducer in the well to watch well, the. We we put a tube down there instead of having to buy a two thousand dollar transducer. Put a tube. Put the transducer on top. Okay. I've never seen that done before. That sounds interesting. I may want to talk to you if there's a break after this. Um, okay, well with that information, uh, fixed speed pump systems, although the industry norm are inherently inefficient, they use more power and are prone to reliability problems. So if they, if they weren't a problem, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you. There wasn't some advantage to, advantage to BFDs. Variable speed pump operations will improve the efficiency of your pumping system, save money, and reduce overall cost of ownership. So, VFD basics. So, 
you might actually hear them called VSDs, VFDs. Well, what they're doing is they're, they're allowing you to change the speed of the motor. Um, so we'll cover the basics of them, you know, how they save you money, basic setup, uh, you know, protection options, some pitfalls. So just to get you started, VFDs are not new. First ones were invented before I was born in the early 60s. Uh, you know, they were, they were very large and expensive, but that's when the technology started in the early 70s. The company I worked for actually invented the first kind of general purpose one. Still, a five horsepower drive was probably bigger than that table you got there that you're sitting in front of. Technology advances, I mean, shoot, I mean, we know how technology advances. I mean, you know, I, I went through college and never had a computer half as powerful as my cell phone nowadays. So things get smaller, things get less expensive, uh, become more applicable and usable for more people. Uh, you know, nowadays VFDs are, are used in so many industries that there's actually drives that are built for each industry. There's drives built for, for air conditioning systems, there's drives built for rock crushing, for, for irrigation. So you've got you know, drives specifically built. So it's no longer one size supposed to be used by everybody. Nowadays it's you know, drives built or designed specifically for an application and you're gonna get more smarts in that drive and you should expect that. The drives can be able to do more for you, it's gonna be easier to program, easier to use, so, the way drives work is the, the speed of the motor is based off the frequency of your AC. What's our, what, what frequency does our AC run at here? 60 hertz, that's right. So if you take a motor from here that runs, let's say, 1,750 RPMs, a four-pole motor, and you take it to Europe, what's Europe run on? 50 hertz, so that motor's gonna go slower. Because it doesn't matter that you know what the voltage is, your torque comes from your voltage, but your speed comes from your hertz, the frequency of the AC. So, you know, when you start a motor across the line, first thing it's doing is it's sitting there and that shaft is sitting still, but your frequency is running at 60 hertz. So as fast as it can, that motor tries to get to full speed because you just put AC on it. And while it's doing that, it's going to pull six to eight hundred or six hundred to eight hundred percent more power for a few cycles until it catches up to speed. And then it'll 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 go back to where it should be. During that time, in some areas, your power company will actually charge you for that small spike. And when you turn on that motor, they'll charge you because they have to have enough power there to meet that demand. Even if you're only going to be using this, when you do this and all your neighbors' lights blink, they don't like that. So they have to have enough power to keep it up here, even though you're only really using it here, so they'll charge you a demand charge. I don't know if yours does. It really is an area-by-area area thing, but uh, I've heard horror stories about people in Lubbock about how, how they do it there. Their, their demand charge will be more than their electric bill for doing something like sawdust collection. So, uh, you know, when you start something up, it's trying to get to that full speed as fast as it can. You know, you can get you know, stress on the irrigation system because you now all at once, you know, it's push, pushing pressure as fast as it can if you got long runs and, and depending on how you have your check valve set up, um, you know, you could have a column of water going down a pipe in a very short period of time just to find itself someplace where it can't all get loose. So, you know, peak charge demands, we talked about that. Limited number of starts per hour, it's not good for the motor if it starts and stops too often. Uh, reduce the life of the system. So, what we're talking about, VFDs. So we're gonna take, does this thing got a laser on it? No. We're gonna take the 60 hertz that's coming in and we're gonna run it into somebody's box. It doesn't have to be a Yaskawa, we have competitors. And from that, you're gonna program what you want the hertz to be. If you tell it you want it to ramp up to 60 hertz, that's full speed and it's gonna put out a waveform very similar to the waveform that it was receiving in. But let's say you want 45 hertz. It's gonna take that waveform, uh, that's, that waveform, it's gonna stretch it out. And so it's gonna be fewer cycles per second. By doing that, it's gonna slow down the motor. Um, 
you know, you're not moving much water at, at 30 hertz. You know, so you're really, your range is usually somewhere between 30 hertz and 60 hertz, depending on what you're doing. But, you know, having that ability to control that um, is going to save you a lot of money. So, the way a drive works is we're going to bring in AC. So here's your three lines in. We're just talking three phase here. We have diodes. Diodes allow current to only pass in one direction. Not a big deal. Really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to you guys. I'm just, there's some things I'm going to talk about here that might make a little more sense since I covered this. So we're going to take the AC that's coming in and run it through a diode bridge. So there's, since it's three phase, you've got three sinusoidal lines. Well, each side's got a high and low side. So those are plus side and minus side. So we need six diodes, two for each phase coming in, one for the top side, one for the bottom mm -hmm. side. And then we take that um, AC, or that it's now AC, we turned it into DC. Well, it's got what they call ripple in it. And it's kind of like if, just like it sounds, it's wavy. Um, and we have to clean that up. So we have capacitors that we clean that up. So we filter or, or clean that up, get us a nice smooth DC. And then we've got six IGBTs, which are just power transistors. So all they do is they're able to you know, switch lots of current and lots of voltage a couple thousand times a second each. And they're going to paint an output waveform that, that they can either, it, does, it looks like a paintbrush. I mean, if you looked at it on a scope, it looks like someone took a paintbrush because it's all these little lines going up and down. What they're doing is they're spreading the time that it's on from the time that it's off to equal the voltage in your sinusoidal output. So if you've got 460 volt, let's say 480 volts coming in, the peak of that voltage, we all call it 480, but the peak of it's actually around 650 volts. The RMS value is 480. So what we end up with is 650. So when we turn our AC to DC, we end up with about 650 volts. We're gonna turn it on and off, kind of like if I was flicking a light switch to where we equal the same voltage that would be in that sine wave. And we do it for the high side, we do it for the low side, and we, we put out what kind of looks like an ugly waveform, but we're able to squeeze it together to go faster or push those pulses farther apart to go slower and control the speed of the motor. When you're, when you're talking about doing single phase, basically, let's say we're bringing in L1 and L2, so we're not using these two diodes over here. So what happens is that's a lot more current going through those diodes, so you have to upsize the drive for that. But even worse, those diodes only let current pass through them when they're at the top of that peak. So going into the DC bus, we've got current going in, you know, in let's say groups of six. Well, now it's in groups of four. So where it was smaller bumps, now it's bigger bumps because it's coming in a third less. And therefore, the capacitor's got to have, it's got more to smooth out, so it takes bigger capacitors. So if you ever have single phase and they talk about derating the drive, that's what they're talking about is having to deal with the diodes being bigger and then the capacitors to smooth out that extra ripple. And it's fairly, it can be fairly significant. Also, we'll, I'll talk about it a little more later. How many of you guys know what harmonics are? Okay, so single phase, horrible for harmonics. I mean, it's because harmonics is a fancy word for saying I'm not using power evenly. That's all it is. That's, oh, okay, sorry. Um, it, it's just a, a fancy way of saying not using power evenly. And what that does is it drives the transformer nuts and call voltage, cause voltage distortion and other things. But it's because when we're converting, and that power's going through those diodes, you're either getting small bumps, or if it's single phase, you're getting big bumps, but those bumps end up giving you a real ugly usage. It's kind of like if you're driving your truck down the highway and doing this to the accelerator. You know, engine wouldn't like it much. Well, transformers don't like it much. But this is the only reason I'm kind of hitting this now is because that's the, the crux to where all the harmonics come from. So... You know, basics again, vary the speed of the AC motor. Um, we get the soft start capability, so instead of that motor trying to catch up to 60 hertz right as soon as you put AC on it, uh, a drive is the best soft start, because how long do you want to take to get up to speed? 
We can take six minutes if we want. And in big applications where they're moving like big rock pressures and stuff, they might take that long. For us, you know, 10, 10 12 seconds is usually more than enough. Uh, but so we've got the start, soft start, so we take away that any chance of that demand charge. And then we can reduce water hammer both on the startup, but more so on the slow down. If you slow the pump down, you're not just cutting off and getting that ringing in the pipe of the water pressure. So you, you can really control a lot of your water hammer by having a drive and being able to, to, to ramp up and ramp down and, and not have that change in pressure on the pipe and get that ringing. Uh, provides protection for the motor. Ground fault, phase loss, uh, motor overload. We, we have two things that the drive can see. Doesn't matter if it's my drive or anybody else's. There, if you've got a transducer on it, it can see pressure. That gives it information. The other thing you can see is how much current the motor is using. The two of those together give the drive actually a, the ability to do a lot of things for protecting the motor and, and making sure there's not problems going on. So, uh, now, on the financial side, does the pump always need to be running at full speed? If it does, there's, there's a thing called a soft starter out there. That they're less, they're about 60% of the price of a drive, you know, give or take a little. And they will allow you to starve the motor of voltage to start up slower. And instead of having like a six or eight times your, your FLA for your demand, you can get around three. So you can definitely take the, a big chunk of that demand charge off. And then they just, they, they, they starve the motor for voltage until it gets up to full speed and then it's out. So there's no harmonics, there's no, you know, there's no intelligence there either after that point. But if all you need to do is get a motor up to full speed and you're trying to avoid demand charges because you've got a 150 horsepower motor, which is big enough that it, it can cause some demand, um, then a soft starter can work. But uh, if you don't need to run the same speed all the time, then, you know, drives are good. Stuff kind of covered renozzling. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the slide I want. But with a centrifugal load, so this actually works for fans and centrifugal pumps. Wouldn't work for a PD pump or a positive displacement pump, for, but for centrifugals, works perfect. And it's called the affinity laws. And what it says is that changing the speed of the shaft has, has a, a direct effect on energy use and pressure. So let's say we take our um, well, we'll just, you know, because I've got it kind of memorized, we'll, we'll say um, we've got a pump that, that uses 100 amps and puts out 100 gallons a minute. I didn't ignore the, the math. We're just doing it. So at full speed, you're getting your 100 gallons a minute. You're using all your power. So 100% power, 100% uh, flow, 100% pressure. Everything's 100%. If you drop that down to 80%, so we've dropped the speed of the shaft by 20%. Well, your flow is at 20% then. So it dropped proportionally with your shaft speed. Your pressure drops to 64%. Your horsepower or your power use drops to 52, 53%. So a small change in, in shaft speed with a centrifugal load has a big benefit on power consumption. And that's where, drive, not just me, but anybody that you know talks about drives talks about how you know, they typically pay for themselves in a few years, just off power savings. Now, there's a lot of other benefits to go with them, but that alone uh, has justified a lot of the industry to use drives on fans and pumps. Uh, on a conveyor belt, that doesn't work. It has to be a centrifugal load. Uh, you know, basic pump application things, things that should be in whatever drive that you're shopping for or looking for, you know, you should have quick start options. You should have, uh, you know, the ability to have calibrated feedback. In other words, the transducer. And all that means is if the transducer is 0 to 140 PSI, the drive lets you put that in so it knows how to scale for that transducer. So that's all that is. Uh, um, you know, set pressure, you know, set, uh, set points for pressure, you know, drawdown levels. Um, and even like uh, uh, the one gentleman was speaking of where we can actually watch the water in the well. So should, you know, 
operator interface ought to talk about gallons per minute and PSI, not just Hertz. Hertz are fine. You know, Hertz tell you what the motor's doing, but there's more information that actually means more to you that, that should be available on the screen. Yeah. So here's some uh, pump protection features. There we go. So start up and draw down. I'm going to kind of walk through this before I let this thing do its animation. But essentially, let's say you want to keep 80 PSI on the pipe. So you tell it, I want 80 PSI. And then you have a transducer, so the drive can see the pressure on the pipe, so it can see the 80 PSI. And then it can also see the current that it's feeding the motor. So you're going along and you, know, you shut off the pivot. Well, the motor's still running, so the drive starts slowing down because it's no longer have, you know, because it's got 80 PSI and it doesn't need it. And let's say you've set 70 PSI as your drawdown level. So if it gets, you know, whenever it's, it's got to at least be 70 before it wakes up, but it, it goes, it drops down, it drops down, it slows down, it slows down, but your, 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 your pressure stays the same. So it, it keeps, until it gets to a certain point, depending on where you programmed it, and then it goes to sleep. And let's say you turn something on. So your pressure starts coming down, gets 70 PSI, he wakes back up. Puts you back up, you know, pushes you back up to 80 PSI and keeps going. And, you know, if you've got the size 40, if you've got more than one pivot, but you want 70 PSI there, you turn on another one, he just speeds up. As long as, he's, as, long as that well and, and, and pump have the capacity. So he's going to match what you need, but when you don't need him, he's going to go to sleep. He's not going to be wearing stuff out. You're not going to have to go shut down the motor. You're not using a gate valve to squeeze stuff down when you want one pressure or, or let it loose when you want another. You're, you're taking advantage of that change in speed to save the money, and also it's easier on the equipment. So, yeah, see, so we're, we're, we're asleep. We wake up, we're going up to our set point. Pre-charge. Anybody got any long runs where they're going? I mean, I had a guy going like nearly a mile one time with water. So real long run. You don't want it just to come up and it, it and, and it goes. Oh, I have no pressure. 60 hertz. Boom! It's pumping as fast as it can. Now you've got a column of water traveling down that pipe for a mile. What's it going to do when it gets to the other end? So not good stuff. So. It, for those situations, the, the drive, you know, and this, my competitor should have this also, the drive should be able to say, hey, for the first five minutes, I'm going to run at like 44 or 46 hertz. And then, and, and really the way you figure this out is you sit there and watch the pressure the first time you do it. So you sit there and you go, okay, it's five minutes. Oh, look, my pressure's now climbing up to where it should be. So then you tell it, hey, drive, every time you start up for the first five minutes, I want you to run it. At, at 44 hertz, and then after that, go by the pressure. So that it's not just going gangbusters if it finds an empty pipe. And so right here we've got it. It's coming up to pre-charge level, so it speeds up to, like I said, 44 hertz, waits there until it gets capacity, and then it goes to its set point. You know, the drive should be smart enough to know when it loses the feedback. So if, uh, you know, if something happens to your transducer, someone cuts the wire on it or something, you know, quits working or um, I've had people tell me they've seen them freeze before. But there's ways kind of like the one Joan was talking about where you can put a stub on them and keep them out of the water so they don't freeze. Uh, but, you know, if something happens to the transducer, the drive should be smart enough to deal with that. If someone slams a, a butterfly valve closed or something, you get a spike in pressure. Your drive should be smart enough to look at that and go, hey, that's way more pressure than I should be seeing. I'm shutting down. And then that forces you to go find out what happened. That's a whole lot better than letting stuff get torn up and finding it the hard way. So, you know, oh, look at our pressure. You know, comes up, it gives you an alarm, it counts down just in case it recovers. You know, because you can go, if you've got something in your system to where you get kind of a spike in pressure, but then it eases off, 
Uh, you can just put a timer in there so that it gives it time to figure out whether that's the case. But if it stays up there, it gives you a fault. Faults are good things on drives. You know, some people think they're bad, but actually if a drive's well programmed and has good firmware, a fault is telling you that it needs attention and instead of doing something bad, it's saying, I'm not doing anything at all. And that's a good thing. Uh, low feedback, uh, same idea. Um, if it's, if it's pressure is dropping, but it's putting, you know, it's it, the motor speed up, it's going, hey, I'm not keeping up with my pressure. I'm going faster, I'm going faster. Okay, I'm at max speed and the pressure's still dropping then it should tell you something's wrong. Something's not right in the system. So the drive should be smart enough to tell you that also. Uh, set point not met. This is a little bit different than the last one, but not by much. But what we're gonna see down here is you're gonna see a broken pipe. And, the, and I don't know about here, but I've heard stories about a pipe breaking and washing out part of the road, you know, depending on where it was and what it did and, and so on. So it can be, you know, it can make a mess in a short period of time. Well, if the drive has a set point of 80 PSI and, it can't, it, and it's working, it just can't ever get it there, it, it can say, hey, enough's enough, and it can stop going, something's wrong. I should be able to get to, you shouldn't give it a set point it can never reach. So, let's see, there we go. So you're saying, where we're trying to get all the water out we can, a person should, <clears throat> not give it a set point you can't ever reach. Our, our goal is just to slow it down where we're not pumping air originally. Okay. Um, and that depends on who's using it. Um, uh, you should have, I mean, if you have a transducer, I mean, you can do that by hand. I mean, if you can figure out where that is, that's fine. But typically, you, you know, typically, hopefully we have enough water that we can actually meet our demand and not be, I mean, from what you're saying, you're never able to get enough water out of the well. That's true. So if that's the case, then, then you don't care about a transducer. You know, I mean, because the pressure's never, you're never gonna wanna give it a, a, a thing where it's at, but most of the time, a lot of guys have enough water, they're just trying not to waste it, especially in the spring when they have more water. You know, if they over pump then, that leaves less for the fall, or you know, the end of the, end of the growing season. So the idea is, use the water you need you know, from the beginning, and hopefully there's something left for you at the end. And, you know, if, but if you're just going, hey, I, I'm just slowing this down just to either stop from sucking up sand or air or whatever it is, then that's a number you figure out and you, you do it more manual. Because that's really not an automated thing. You're just using it kind of as a soft start in a fixed speed drive. Adjustable. Yeah, adjustable, but not variable. It's not gonna move around for you. You're just saying, hey, drive, I want you to do 55 hertz because that's as much as I can get and not be, you know, getting air, sucking up sand, whatever it may be that, you know, happens when, you, when, you're, when you're pulling too much water out of the well. You know, it can tell, uh, you know, if you got a dry well, loss of prime. And, and basically there, if you've got, you got to have a transducer though. But it goes in the, the you know, the pressure's falling, it's speeding up, you know, uh, it's currents falling, so it's not using any amps. Well, there's only one thing it can be if that's the case. If, if I'm at full speed, I'm only pulling no load amps, it means I don't have any water. I need to shut off. So, and you can actually do that without a transducer. A transducer doesn't hurt any, but it can actually tell that without the transducer because it can just, um, you know, if you, you set it up to where if it runs at no load amps for, you know, 10 seconds, fault, quit running. I don't want to, I don't want to tear up my pump. Now this is a little, a little bit different. This is uh, the ability to, instead of running off pressure, pressure run off current. Have you ever had a pump that was going bad? It moved some water, but wouldn't, you know, didn't move everything. Um, I've had people, you know, not that often, but it's an interesting feature where the pump isn't working quite right, but I can't get anybody out to pull the thing uh, until Monday, and it's, you know, it's Friday. So you can set the drive up to, instead of running off of, of, of pressure, to run off current. So if the FLA was, once again, 100 amps, it just won't let you go beyond that. You only may be getting, you know, 
a portion of the water you normally get at that speed out of it, but it won't burn up the motor trying to do it. So it'll, it'll monitor and, and go by the motor amperage instead of by the pressure until you can get it fixed. And so that's a hard current limit. Yeah. Ah, there's an impel, impeller anti-jam. This is just basically a, a feature you can enable if you're in the right place in the country, and I don't know whether this would even be applicable to where periodically you can have it set up and it'll, it'll sit there and just um, won't work on most of what you guys have because you guys have a hollow or a, a VHS is so. But if you had the type of pump that was either a submersible or another type of pump and you get corrosion in it or something, it can sit there and it'll just ratchet back and forth and try to break stuff up in the pump. But on a vertical hollow shaft, you wouldn't want to do that. First of all, you should have your little gear thing on there that stops it from going backwards. So you never enable it for that reason. And if you don't have it there, you could spin the thing off and lose your, lose your shaft from what I understand. So not necessarily a great feature for you all, but it's an interesting feature. Uh, this is what we're talking about uh, earlier. The gentleman was talking about he's got a second transducer and he's running a pipe, he said, down the hole and puts the transducer at the top of the pipe instead of getting a, normally you have to get a pressurized uh, cable for the transducer. And that's where he was talking about the expensive transducer. So if you're running at 500 foot, you have to tell the transducer company that's how much wire went on. You can't cut the thing. And you run it down and you put it below water level. And then what happens is the drive can both watch pressure on the, on the output side and it can watch pressure basically in the well or the suction side. And it can, it gives you the ability at that point to, um, you know, when there's plenty of water there, it'll run off the pressure side, it'll give you what you want, it'll do your output, but if it ever sees that drop too low, it'll either slow you down or turn you off until, until you recharge enough to, to have water to, to keep going. So here, the, the, the example here is the suction side of a, a pump. And I have done stuff, I know at least in Hereford, on the suction side of a booster pump before, where a gentleman had multiple uh, wells, and then he would turn on however many wells he wanted to run based on how many pivots he's going to run. So he might have, I think he had like seven wells, but he, sometimes he only ran three of them. Well, it gave him really odd output, so he put a, a booster pump and a drive on that booster pump, and we sat there and monitored the a transducer, transducer on the suction side of it and, and basically we're bouncing around between like four and six PSI. And so if the pressure ever got too high, we'd speed up. If the pressure ever got too low, we'd slow down. So we'd use kind of an inverse, uh, what they call PID loop to do it, but it, it worked for him. It worked well enough, he's, he's told a bunch of his neighbors that were doing the same thing about it because it worked so well for him. So you can do some interesting stuff with that second transducer or with uh, a transducer on the suction side. So if you do have a submersible, you know, the drive should be smart enough to know how to, how to make sure that you, you speed that motor up enough to take care of the thrust bearing. Um, should be able to check for no flow, deadhead protection, loss of prime, well, general, well dry run, uh, high and low pressure, mainline breakage, uh, pump over cycling, suction, you know, you should be able to do suction control, sensing of jams for certain types, for submersibles. Um, on, the jam, on the jam function, does it increase torque to where you can, whenever it comes back forward, or how does that work? Say that again? We've had a, a pumps that we had installed in wells that pump a little bit of sand. Mm -hmm. And you can start them the first time and they'll run. If for some reason you have to shut it off pretty quick in the first week, there could be enough sand in there that it will jam. And we've increased the thrust to try to overcome that locked rotor. So I didn't know if that function would do that or not. Uh, we could, but well, you're talking about a vertical, but you're talking no, about- No, no, I'm talking about submersible. Submersible, okay, yeah. Um, that, that's whatever number we want to put it at. We want the thrust, I mean, normally what we do is we go to 30 horse, or 30, 30 hertz, and the first 
two seconds at least. And what that's for is there's a thrust bearing in a submersible pump that you got to keep wet and cooled or else you'll tear it up. And normally if you're starting across the line, of course, it's going to 60 hertz in the first quarter of a second, so it's no problem, but you put a drive on it and you take a drive that's not built for irrigation and they may have a default of 10 seconds and you will tear up that pump. So like our drives, and I'm sure others do too, we actually come out of the box set up for a submersible. Five minutes. Okay. Um, so if, um, if they put it on a vertical hollow shaft, it just means they've got the thrust bearing stuff working. If they don't know to, to change that, it doesn't hurt anything. But if they take a drive that's, that needs that thrust bearing protection and put it on, you know, and they don't have it, they put it on a submersible, it will tear stuff up. So all I was going to do is talk about, remember earlier when we were talking about harmonics? You know, I talked about the diodes and letting power come through. Well, if you hear anybody talking about harmonics, once again, remember, all it is is the fact that the drives do not use power evenly. My laptop doesn't do it. Your, your fluorescent lights don't do it. The problem is they're not 150 horsepower. So drives make a bigger difference just because of their size. And you can get, you know, instead of that nice, pretty sinusoidal, you can actually get things that almost look like bunny rabbit ears. And that's what drives the transformers nuts. I believe it also, in some places, if you got smart meters, they don't like it. So, you know, that's what we're talking about. You know, the drives, you can add a, a line reactor or a DC bus choke to them, and you get something that looks more like a cowboy hat. Still definitely more sinusoidal than the bunny rabbit ears. You could put a harmonic filter on it on the front. Um, uh, some companies have, have uh, an active front end you can run on the front end. And those are actually really, really don't have a big cost penalty. I mean, it's a little bit more money, but if you're doing single phase with that active front end, the active front end will actually handle that, you know, the, the, the single phase in, take care of all those harmonics, or most of them, get you down to around 10%, which is probably more than good enough. I tried calling your electric company and asked where they were at, and the guy didn't understand the question. You know, where, where do your meters break? And it didn't, I didn't get anywhere with him. But um, you can get around 10%. A harmonic filter should get you around 5%. An active front, a true active front end drive, uh, like our matrix technology, actually gets you around 5%, but they're a lot more money. So harmonic filters are probably more affordable if the power company comes and tells you, hey, you got to do something for your harmonics. Um, My power company, we're, we're adding some more, and they said, go ahead and try it without a filter. And if we have to add that later, I well, that's a reasonable way. I mean, find out if it breaks before you fix it, you know, instead of putting stuff in, band-aiding something that may not need it and spending that money. So that's, that's fine. Uh, like I said, for single phase, and if there's harmonic concern, we actually have a really good solution for that. But uh, both Maris and, and MTE and some other companies make harmonic filters that you can just put in front of them. So if one day you're cruising along, you get a letter from the electric company saying, hey, you're, you've got excessive harmonics, that's something you can go buy and add in after the fact. Because in front of the, uh, the drive, the drive? Yeah, it's basically uh, in front of the drive, right. yeah. Uh, the only thing that goes after the drive would be a long lead filter, would be like a sine wave filter, a DVD-T filter, uh, and that's if you're running excessive links between the drive and the motor. On the front end of the drive, it'd be a harmonic filter. A lot of times, uh, just making sure you've got line reactors on them, might be enough to, to handle that situation. It really depends, like I said, I tried calling, originally they were gonna have a guy here that was gonna kinda talk about that, and so I was kinda curious where the line was, you know, you know, could you tell me, oh well, as long as you're under 15% total harmonic distortion, you're okay, or is it 10%, or is it, where is it? And the guy didn't understand the question, so I didn't get, I didn't get what I was looking for. Don't worry yes, so much, so they wanna go by the, the IEEE, the new one? 2014 IEEE 519. Um, yes, sir. What is that percentage again? Uh, depends. There's actually a chart in it. Uh, rule of thumb, it's five. Uh, but now I know in um, uh, Central Valley will actually help pay for your low harmonic drive if you're down in that area. I don't know about some of the other ones. But Central Valley, I've met with them. I've got several of our low harmonic drives in there, and they didn't even go out to test them. 
uh, but it's a different type of technology. Instead of having those diodes and capacitors, it's, it, it's, a, it's a different technology, but it's very efficient, uh, extremely good power factor, and, and almost no harmonics. But it's expensive. But they offset it. In that area, they pay $75 a horsepower towards a low harmonic drive. So, you know, you can get the power company to actually chip in to help pay for that, some of that. I don't know that, I mean, Texas isn't nearly as friendly, typically. Um, but in New Mexico, anything over, I think, 75 horsepower, they demand at least a soft start on. So folks over there are already used to having to at least buy a soft start, if not a drive. They're because in years, so Are they? Used to. You could, if your grandfather did, you don't have to. But anything new, they're, I don't know what the horsepower is. I think it's 75 or 100, but they're, they're demanding a soft start. Well, if, you start, if you're starting up that 150 horsepower uh, uh, motor across the line, that is nasty on the grid. I mean, he, he's pulled out a bunch of current over, I mean, it's only a short period of time, but they have to deal with it. Well, so. the, the sinus wave, you know, they, that's what they, they told us, that it'll, it'll, some pumps, you just burn the pump out, with, and said some need it and some don't. Well, is, is that? Uh, sine wave filter, it, it's all about distance. Um, and it, it, it comes down to, like on your vertical hollow shaft motors, they're going to handle that distance better than a submersible. Vertical hollow shafts, any new motor is going to be NEMA Part 31, and I'm not a motor guy, blah, blah, blah. But there's, there's, it's basically BFD rated. What they've done is they've added extra insulation on the windings to allow for working with a, a BFD because those transistors I showed you that switch on and off 2,000 times a second, when they turn on and off, there's a little bit of overshoot. So, you know, it's turning on and off, on and off, on and off. Well, there's a little bit of overshoot. That overshoot magnifies over distance. And so if you take something out a thousand foot, you may have spikes that are three times your bus voltage. So you may, your spikes may be, what did I say, 650, 13, almost 2,000 volts. So there, they, they, there needs to be some type of mitigation because you're right at the rating of the insulation and you can start poking little holes, burning little holes in the insulation, you burn enough of them up and you'll actually, you know, do what they call a first term burn on it, which motor fails. So yes, but it's a distance thing. Distance and actually grade of your wire, the insulation of your wire, there's a thing called a, a, a corona effect that actually, technically two times DC bus voltage is all you should be able to see, but if that corona effect kicks in, then it goes to three times DC bus voltage. So, yeah, harmonic filter, if you're going 1,000 foot, harmonic filter. But for, if you guys are doing mostly uh, vertical turbines, the drive shouldn't be that far away from the motor. So it shouldn't, actually it should, really shouldn't be, I mean, as long as it's 50 foot, it, it's a non-issue. But for a sub that's in the ground corner, well, subs are different because, first of all, they only have like a thousand volts of insulation on their windings. So they're very sensitive to it. And, and yeah, if it's a, if it's 500 foot, you're going to have to have some filter. I, I'm actually probably 400 foot. You can probably get away with a load reactor up to maybe around 400 foot. And these numbers depend on some variables, so don't take these as hard numbers. But probably around 400 foot, you're going to bump from a load, load reactor to a DVDT filter. And somewhere around a thousand foot, you got to bump up to a sine wave filter. And MTE makes a very good DVDT filter. I've had customers use it, and uh, uh, one of the one of the better ones out there. I'm not trying to do a commercial for them, but I have seen really good results for them. Is typically the older DVDT filters. I got squeamish around seven eight hundred foot, but that MTE Century, I think they call it, they're they're pretty safe to a thousand foot. Is there a difference in, you're talking about uh, insulation. On submersibles, we have a lot of trouble with leaking uh, heat shrink. Is there a heat shrink that is variable frequency duty rating? We have to pull a lot of, we have to pull a lot of pumps. And you can see it with an analog meter, but you don't see it with a true RMS meter. You pull it out, redo the splices, put it back in and it runs. Hmm. So we, we just think that there's leaky splices, I guess you would say. And it goes back to insulation. 
Yeah, the insulation that I'm really talking about is is uh, how tight it is to the copper. Right. And that is the the better it is, the higher that that corona initiation point is. So you're trying to avoid getting into that. But wouldn't that um, be the same at a splice right above the motor? Maybe I'm not. I really. I, I'd love to give you a, you know a good answer, but I'd be making it up. Okay. So um, I, I don't know. I've never had the question before, but. Um, I'm actually meeting around some wire guys this weekend. I actually may ask them. Uh, it, it happens a lot, a lot. You know, they, 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 there is differences in wire. Now, when they talk about shielded wire, Yaskawa, at least our company, doesn't care about that. We care about how good the insulation is, but shielded wire, we're, you know, not such a big deal to us. We just, we just list the gauge that you need. Uh, that's about the only spec we give for wire. So, tell you what. I got a question. Yes, sir. Say your normal hollow shaft speed is at 1750. Mm -hmm. What percent above and below can you run that without hurting anything? I've heard 10%. I've heard. Well, below you can go probably down to 20 hertz. What percent? It, it, well, 20 hertz would be a. Uh, 30, 33%. 33%. Yeah, it, but it'll say on the motor what the minimum speed is, and what you're doing there is um, the, the, those are self-cooled motors. So at one end of the shaft, there's a fan. Well, the motor's got to run fast enough that that fan can blow air across the motor to keep it cool. If it wasn't for that, let's say if you had a blower on the motor, you'd go down to one hertz. It wouldn't matter. So the real, the real thing you're doing there is you're making sure you don't go so slow that, that you're not cooling the motor, not allowing the motor to self-cool anymore. And, and other than that, you know, but once again, I don't know that you can move much water under 30 hertz. Uh, I mean, you guys well, tell I've me heard, if you I've can. i you can only go down 10%, no, I've had people tell me 20%. No, no, so it has to do with the motor cooling. For, for speed, the drive doesn't care. The drive can sit there and run all day long at one hertz. How much okay. over speed? Are you kind of over speed? Per, per um, uh we tell you to ask your motor guys. <laughs> but but, you, but you're, you're basically just cycling those things. And it, I've, I've heard a lot of people say you can't go over cycle because that's what the deal is. But back to the affinity laws, if I've got some more water there and enough horsepower, instead of changing the pump, why don't I just speed that motor up a little bit and get a little more water? Out? Well, the motor can't produce any more torque than what it is at 60 hertz. But I have seen customers go 62, 63 hertz, and seem not to hurt anything. Uh, you know, how much higher you can go than that? As far as I know, as long as you don't exceed your full, full load amperage, as your motor is ready to pour, should be all right. But your torque will peter out. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I understand, understand, but that's, that's more a horsepower issue. Yeah. And so long as I've got excess horsepower, I mean, I've got guys on fans that believe it or not, air temperature in the summertime air is thinner than it is in the wintertime. So in the summertime, they can maybe run at 63 hertz. In the wintertime, they can only run at like 58 because the, they'll overcurrent their motor because the air is thicker, which puts more load on it. So th there, there's, there's fudge room in there. I don't know that I'd go like 66 hertz. You know, unless your motor guy tells you he thinks you're okay doing it, and then look at your pump curve to see what that's going to do there. If it sets you way off the, the pump curve, then it might not benefit you any. But, but the pump curve is still affinity law, right? Speed, just like you were talking about slowing it down, the same, same thing works in reverse, speeding it up, right? For flow and pressure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, horsepower is going to stay about the same. Because once again, it shouldn't be pulling any more torque. You, your torque curve peters out at 60 hertz. Um, but yeah, that's there, there's there's probably room in there to play with that. Yeah, yeah I I don't know that I'd be comfortable going you know like 10 percent over. Five percent would be probably probably somewhere Maybe. there. Yeah. So. But I think that would get you where you need to be. You know. Okay, we're good. Basically, the only other thing is watch your power. I'm going to skip through a bunch of this because I've been out of time for 10 minutes. Um, if you ever have corner-grounded delta, um, you're okay. 
the drive, at least the Escala drives can run in corner grounded delta just fine. But if you ever get open delta, be careful of that because you've got one of your legs there. It's going to be, it's not going to behave. Ground leg, yeah. Yes, grounded leg. Um, so you get an open delta, and the way you can tell is if you've got three cans of the same size, you got good three phase. If you got one can feeding you three phase, you're okay. But if you ever see two cans and they're different sizes, that's an open delta. And I'll be honest, you almost need to size it like single phase because that one phase, if you don't have a drive there, it'll tear up your motor. It's, it's, it's horrible power. Unfortunately, there's lots of it out there. Um, but watch for that. And uh, like I said, if you're ever putting a drive on it, you probably need to size it more like single phase and then you don't have to depend on that one phase being in balance for the motor to work and everything to be protected. So, yeah, power surges are bad. Pay a little extra money for uh, uh, surge protection. It doesn't have to be, the ray cap stuff's really good, but any surge protection is better than no surge protection. Uh, even enclosures, don't box your drives like that. And there we go. Guys, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, I don't know, they, you guys taking a break after this? Yeah, we okay. are on break. If anyone's got questions, I'll be around for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Jeff will be around, but you won't be around for lunch, so if you've got questions, get to them. Let's take Cam. We've got to get caught up, Cam. <laughs>